five hundred miles north of vancouver there's a mountain with two names the white people they tell me it's called russia to bowl they say that's french for rolling rock to get some people they call it stick yodin which means it stands alone the gig sun and the wet so attend people say they've lived here since the last ice age Settlers and missionaries moved in about a hundred years ago. The Gixan call the non-natives the visitors who never left. The chiefs claim that this valley and everything within 22,000 square miles belongs to them. been in public use for 120 years and uh, but there are towns villages and farms and uh, you know there's Smithers there's Houston there's Hazelton's uh, you know there's a whole industry and infrastructure and uh, that depends on that land and that's all been allowed to evolve uh, maybe over feeble protests from the natives in the past uh, certainly there's a strong protest now but I think it's a little too damn late I mean time must mean something stops why is it stopping here because we have told them not to progress any farther with this uh, road into the Gitsan lands and that uh, we want to meet with them before they do any more development on the Carpenter Creek they've already got their ribbons up there eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they've got plans of going into Gitsan territory yeah we will fight them we will stop them we're committed to it. We cannot uh, lie to ourselves. We're not going to move. We're going to stay. We have to stop it. And right now, this is Trevor Cutlow. Trevor Cutlow is drawn up on a horse called Land Plains 2. Whoa, did he come and spoken. We're going to see who wins right now. Outside, Trevor Cutlow on Land Plains 2. Land claims, logging, cowboys, Indians. The province we call British Columbia is my home. I'm white. I'm from the city and I've headed north to the mountains where a major land claims case is challenging our history of Canada. I need to find out, can people, native and white, live in a land both claim as their own? People like Duncan Henderson. It's 6 a.m. I'm in Duncan's pickup. Duncan's a faller. He cuts trees down for a living. It's the most dangerous and highest paid job in the bush. In a good year, he earns $90,000. Duncan was born in the same valley he logs. His father was a logger too. better jobs and easier ways to make make a living huh? but what else is there to do right here in this valley love the money I shouldn't have said that but <laughs> uh, it's honest I mean it's, it's, it's no it's the money really it's good money actually I like the job 
But you're more independent. That's the thing I like about it. You're just all on your own. Notch or undercut and back cut up to four or five trees, eh? Sometimes more, and then you you find when it's leaning the right way and you push them, eh? and then you you just your production is tripled. Eh? In your falling career? Yeah, right. I think he, we well, figured roughly that he's around the million mark, and I'm probably around 600,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. The valid reason is definitely on the side of the native people, and that is they want to have a say in, on how things are done, and they want a piece of the pie, basically, which they feel they're not getting. Um, they actually do get a big piece of pie, but that seems to be easily overlooked. Do you think that the natives have more of a claim to this valley than your family has, for instance? No. All of our history lays in those mountains. Uh, the Eagle Clan will only survive if, if we can continue to use those, those lands there. And why I say that is, is I look at the long term, and I say long term, three, four hundred years from now, that we still want to see the Eagle Clan living and having rights to the territories for the uses that we have. Our people always work on seasons, depending on where they're at for what they're doing, whether it be trapping or fishing during the summer. They're using different parts of the territories all the time. Art Loring is a gig son. Art sees his people losing control of the land. Their hereditary territories are being clear-cut. Salmon streams are being destroyed. A way of life is in danger of slipping away. I find out the word Gixan means people of the river. This fishing site on the banks of the Skeena River belongs to this woman, Skyan. It's belonged to Skyan for thousands of years because Skyan is a chief's name in the Eagle Clan, and the name has been passed down from one generation to the next. Skyan tells me that other names carry with them the ownership of other fishing sites belonging to each of the four Gixan clans. She says the stories of these sites are passed down in songs and in spoken history. To the chiefs, the rivers provide more than food. They hold the history of the Gixan. It's winter. A white family from Ontario has bought property on the banks of the Skeena. I arrive with my video camera where they're building their home. What they don't understand is that they're sinking their foundations into a key Gixan fishing site. I bought the property, so I don't know. We're just here trying to find out what you want to do with this particular piece of land. I'm building a house on it. I'm going to live here. It's right on top of us. And we're 
We're here today to serve you notice. We are members of the Frog Clan from Kipunga. Um, here we have our chief, Klanwa, Halos, Sanan, Skinner. and Skenna. And my, my chief name is Takchu. Takchu. Where your house is situated is part of our territorial area. You are also located directly below our fishing site. Uh, right now, you are aware that we are the Kitsanatoda and are before the courts. We are currently appealing the land claims court case. We have agreed, and they have agreed, in principle, that anything that we we're claiming would, would wait until the appeal. So at this time, we would like to present this notice to you. Okay, I mean, do you mind explaining to me? Or yeah. Are you allowed to talk now? Or? Yes. You'd like to know why we're presenting you this uh, notice. This yeah. notice. Right. The uh, chief had a meeting a number of years back when the land claims went to court. There is no property or anything is to be, to be done, no transaction to be done by the Crown during the court case. And this is one of them. So we take it you are trespassing on my territory. So we're asking you when you read it, it's given you so many hours to leave this property. Well, I mean, I don't see how you can say that it's a contentious property. It was freehold land and has been since 1912. If you so, decided you'd wanted your money back, we'd have to put up a meeting and put our money together to pay you back. And we'd still ask you to leave, because it's our territory. And it's not to be sold until the court case is, is, I, I have no is completed. I have no intention of selling it. This is my home. We live here already. Well. Can you just wait for a second, please? OK. He asked the question, John. Free to ask. No, I so uh, appreciate it. But uh, we were in a long understanding that this was under any uh, land claim since it was a freehold piece of property. We don't want no hassle. We I, don't want I, no threat. I, we don't want anybody to say anything bad no, to you. No. But that notice was signed by our chiefs and witnesses, giving you 48 hours to leave the territory. Well, thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. And I'll take it under consideration. You bet. Thank you very much. 48 hours, we'll be back. Make sure you're gone. Oh. OK, thank you. Thank you. Caught you by surprise, I take it. He <laughs> who's come back. <laughs> the Youngman family has bought land at a place the BC road map calls Boulder Creek. The Gixon call it Lac Witin. Glenn Williams says it's his grandfather's fishing site and it's fed his family for generations. In 1913, without consulting the chiefs, the provincial government sold this land into white hands for the first time. Glenn's grandfather was forced to tear down his smokehouse, but the land was never built on until now. <laughs> Oh God, to lack to this mark to me. Oh, blessed Jesus, men and good God, to the hidden, tarnish a little bit yet, oh God. Amen. Amen. Before the 48 hour deadline runs out, the RCMP have hurriedly called a meeting between the Youngmans and the Ganetta, the Frog Clan. The Youngmans have brought their papers from the land registry office. The Ganetta clan have brought their spoken histories. All I'm asking you is to appreciate the situation we're in and the survey we were given, which is supposed to be a legal survey. So is our title on our land all legal? We can't go around it. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We have to go through it. It's our territory. On this part of the world, God put us here 
God put you in Ontario, I didn't come to threaten you. I just asked you to leave my territory. My territory. The Gixans say they'll pay the Youngmans a fair price for the land. The Youngmans request more time. Ladies and gentlemen, the visitors who haven't left. Sorry, Mr. Junkman. I give you 10 days, Mr. Junkman. 10 days and not another board nailed to your cabin within that 10 days. Thank you very much. I felt kind of um, sorry for them because they um, explained their their position and that it should have been the people that sold the land to the Youngmans that, that should have been in dispute with Ganetta clan. I guess once they told their story too, I could sort of, um, it made me understand how they felt. And I had to understand how we felt too, because um, we used that, that land and that um, fishing hole. Deep in, in my heart, in my own thoughts, I, I was um, prepared to, to do anything like for the clan, for that land, like to keep that land for our kids. The Frog Clan signs real estate papers to buy the Youngman's land. We have another problem with we land or food from the sign. But just as the meeting is breaking up, the signing is interrupted by three members of another clan. Can you do it for we land? Sit down. You guys sit down. We're going to talk about the great, great grandfather's land. They say the territory belongs to them, the Killer Whale Clan. They're afraid this sale from the White family will somehow favor the frogs in this ancient land dispute between two Gixan clans. White man is on the territory. Okay, we're getting the white man off that territory. The paper is signed and we've given it to the lawyer. Who's going to have legal title of this land? That has to be worked out. And Ganetta has the stories and the songs to back everything up that they're claiming? We're finished for the day. Thanks. We're going to get the lawyer, and oh. we're going to fight that land. We're going to get it back. Where Not the dead people that are down in the ground there to tell back his family what to do. Where's our honor? No way. All I hear about land claims and what's going on amongst us Indian people within our boundaries is unity. And okay, without, no, I'm not waiting. Without unity. Listen, just one minute. One second. Okay? You can listen now. This land here, I don't know who's, who owns it. If it's uh, Canada or you guys, don't stand so close to me. If you guys want to own it, I don't know who owns it. But what's happening here is some white people have this land and the people want to go fishing and uh, set up a smokehouse, and this white man says, no, you can't come across our land anymore. It's going to go into trust, into the trust of the name of whoever's going to be there. We're not taking any land from you guys now, or any land from the Ganada. We can't. That's not our job. But our job is to get that land from that white man, and that's all we're doing. The Gixan eventually bought the land. The killer whales continue to challenge the frog clan. And the youngmans? They've moved away. They say what happened to them was extortion. It makes me think. What was it called when the Gixan were first forced off this land? Extortion? Intimidation? The chiefs say it was theft. A theft which goes far beyond a single fishing site. The 
Gixan and Wet'suwet'en people are taking the government of British Columbia and Canada to court. They say 22,000 square miles of their land, its trees and rivers are being stolen. 11 p.m. in the office of the hereditary chiefs. Ardith Wilson is working late, again. Are you ready to do some more checking, Veronica? Since 1984, the chiefs have been fighting the boldest land title action in the history of Canada. They refuse to settle for anything less than outright control of the land itself. This is a carton fish. Damn it, you know, um, we never gave up our ownership to the land. And because there's fear that we are being too extreme or that we have no right to ask for this, and because um, other groups are really fearful of that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. I mean, we can't settle for something that uh, is less than what we know to be true. I mean, when my grandchildren, when, if I live that long, sit on my knee and, and things, you know, how do things look 20, 30 years from now? Can I look into my grandchild's eyes and say, we fought it? Appendix 519. The chiefs argue that the land is theirs to use and protect because history says so. A history not written down in our books, but spoken in their oral histories. Our oral histories have evolved over time as well. And we chose not to record them in writing because of how we see the world. Don Ryan is the chief strategist of the court case. He negotiates with politicians, lawyers, and bureaucrats. He calls it fancy dancing, dealing with people who refuse to believe anything about Gixan history unless it's written down in books and maps. So what we tried to do in the court case was to bring that forward so that, that we could have this debate. Let the courts consider it. Let, let people discuss this. How, how do we determine history? Is it just because we put it on in paper? Is it truth if we put it on paper? Is that the assumption? Is it the truth when we record it in writing? This case is a battle between two histories. It poses an uncomfortable question. As a white community, can we accept a history that isn't of our own making? The elders agreed to reveal to the court their clan's spoken histories, their adawak, as they call them. Some took days to tell, as a language and a culture slowly filled a room full of legal binders bound for a white justice. From the elders' testimonies, a complete map of the Gixan and Wet'suwet'en territories emerged on paper for the first time. The first people to walk a territory, they're the rightful owners. That's what the old people says, our, our grandfathers. When they walked that territory and came back, they brought those stories and the songs and the names of the, of the creeks and, and mountains around and the lakes and, and what, what happened, their, their whole adventure they brought back, not just the food. And those are the stories that, that we use as our history. Doubt. And that's our evidence and our proof of where where our boundaries are. And that's why that's why we have the feasts and the stories and the songs. And all these all these stories and songs have been passed down by mouth to ear from generation to generation. One by one, the elders told the court about the traditional ways of their clans. Then, 
it was left to a white judge to decide if the elders history provided proof that they indeed held title to the land when we went into trial they had done something that they'd never done before they had just opened themselves up and say look with all truth and honesty look at us this is who we are we've never shown anybody to the extent that we're showing you and they did that and they did it you know knowing that uh, they were talking to someone who was ignorant the provincial government on march 8 1991 chief justice mckechran brought down his decision now the protesters can stay but the rcmp aboriginal rights he said were extinguished by the colonial government 130 years ago the chief justice has completely ignored our people Native life before white contact, he wrote, was nasty, brutish and short. He dismissed the chief's claim to ownership of the land. He dismissed the elders' oral histories as unreliable evidence. The government has never been convinced that there is a valid claim in law of Aboriginal land title. I can understand that they will be hostile to the judgment, but I don't think that will further their... their their case. Let's consider this not to be a win-lose situation, but an opportunity. And I want everyone affected by this decision to think carefully about it in the days ahead, and not to overly react to it. They put the rope around the neck and hang them up. That's what the government did to us. All the chiefs put the rope and hang the, the old people, you know, the Shimgiyit, hang them up one by one. That makes me sad. I'm so mad too. After all, what we done trying to make him listen. That's why we put tin in his ear. Let him go! Away from the courts, the house of Chief Hanamuch raises two poles. The poles are Gixan history books, each carved figure a chapter of spoken history. The spirit of Chief Justice McEachern appears, replete with tin ears and waving a copy of his court decision. The judge, who refused to accept the Adalic of the chiefs as legitimate history, now finds himself forever etched into the oral history of the Gixan people. The McEachern, the justice, the only sane person in the judicial system as far as I'm concerned, he called it as he saw it. It was presented to him, he passed judgment, and he called it. It wasn't a very diplomatic decision, but it was the truth. Some people welcomed the judge's decision. Les Whitwer bought land and retired here. At one time, he taught both Gixen and white students at the local high school. When the Europeans first came, certainly, there was a clash of cultures. At that time, cultures. But at that time, their culture died because it gave way to the European culture. There's no question about it. All you have to do is look at these people. Where in their living style, in their standard of living, in their style of living, do you see anything that in any way resembles the culture that existed here when the Europeans came? The chiefs are appealing to a higher court to overturn Judge McEachern's decision. Meanwhile, trees are being cut. 
deals are being made. The most eager buyers for wood from British Columbia's forests, the Japanese. I travel south, away from Gixon territory. I watch as the biggest forest company in the province, Macmillan Blodell, entertains its top customers. These will go for the gift to the people of British Columbia by H.R. Macmillan, who was formerly the president of uh, Macmillan Blodell Limited. The park preserves about 300 acres of old growth forest, which is very typical of the forest that covered all of southwestern British Columbia 150 years ago. <laughs> lunch and then we will have the welcoming ceremonies which include the water bomber drop. Then the annual sale of Macmillan Blodell's best lumber, auctioned off, Japanese style. Canadian executives swap business suits for Japanese happy coats, and the industry watches to see just how much the market will offer this year. Top buyer award for the 1991 auction. Congratulations. is something that you work in one way or another and and that's the way that the land feeds you i mean you go there and you cut down trees or you plant rice and harvest it or wheat or potatoes or whatever or you you build houses on it but i mean you've got to do things with land because the land itself does not support you it doesn't support anything whether you have control or not i mean doesn't make any difference up north i talked to pete weber pete's working for west star timber logging territory claimed by the Gixon. If the native people think that they could generate more wealth from that land than is being generated under the present system, well, I'd like to see it. I don't know. I don't really see how they could. Uh, I hear so many different things that, well, if we were in charge of land, we'd do this or that, but a lot of it is basically doing nothing with the land. So that, you know, that does not generate wealth. Uh, and I guess if you don't generate wealth in the land, well, then you're then basically you you uh, you've got to live on hand out some autumn or whatever. This thing that uh, this European concept. This white man's concept that the land is useless and of no value unless you do something with it. Yes, there's riches in trees, if you will, on our territories, but uh, we're not going to clear cut it. 
And I think when, the, for the most part, when our people talk about economic development, especially in relation to their territory, they're talking about um, sustainability, not so much mega profits and then pack up and move away after you've made your first million. We're talking about providing a standard, a quality of life for our people that the rest of Canada enjoys, but at the same time ensuring that you're going to have something there for future generations. <laughs> don't control the land, you work for those who do. 126 people work in this mill. Two-thirds of them are native. This is Westar Timber's new Carnaby sawmill, the economic miracle which the company promised would guarantee jobs for the valley. Decisions at Westar are made far away, at corporate headquarters in Vancouver. And the wood? It's headed for Japan. Carnaby is a hungry mill. Its critics say it will soon squeeze smaller mills out of the business. Carnaby saws 3,000 trees a day. Trees which come off land the hereditary chiefs say is theirs. I uh, up on the hill already, eh? Chris Skulsh pays three grand a month to keep his two logging trucks on the road. After we had a while. Why is that right? Okay, I'm just about ready to come off the highway here now. Chris is a Gixan hereditary chief. Hundreds of Gixan loggers, mill workers, and truckers make their living from logging. I do my own business, and I'm, I like it. That's the way I feel it. Well, look what happened now. See it down here? No trees down there, eh? I think that's a problem there for us. Now, now you're a logger. Yeah. You're, you're part of that. Do yeah, I'm part of the logger, yeah. So what, what do you think about the logging? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? <clears throat> well, it's good for me. It's my bread and butter. That's the way I look at myself. If I don't work, well, what I'm going to do. So even though it takes down the trees on your land. Yeah. Even I found my own trees up there, my own land. <laughs> At first Calvin, eh? You've, you've logged the yeah. trees on your own hereditary land. Right. What does it look like up there? It's just clear cut up there now. Nothing. I used to trap up there a long time ago, before the logging came in. And now? Yeah. Anything? No, nothing up there. All the trees is gone. Calvin Heisen's Gixan name is Chief Simadix. Except for a small stand of trees, all of his hereditary land has been clear-cut by logging crews. They've left Simadix a poorer chief, unable to support his clan. They have weakened the position that Simadix holds. And in doing that, it's a disgrace to that chief of what they have done to him. And how in the world could they ever begin to repair that? When Calvin comes to a feast and, and says, uh, while I hold this territory and the chiefs 
can't hardly acknowledge that because he's got nothing to provide for his members with. He's got a barren land, and that barren land is, is not going to be able to feed his family. never signed a treaty giving up control of the land. But by 1870, they were being forced onto reserves anyway. And by 1927, the Indian Act outlawed any attempt by natives to get their land back. Under the Indian Act, basically what they were telling us was, look, you are the wards of the state, the ward of the country. Um, and, and being a ward, as people would understand, is that you're like a child incapable of taking care of yourself and looking after your needs. Therefore, you need someone like a father or a mother to take care of those needs for you. And the best, and this, I mean, this is the logic behind pushing us on reservations, to make the land, to steal the land, really, but this is the logic that they used, is that so that you're all together in a nice little bundle on this nice, tight little reserve, and then we can take care of you, we'll provide your house, we'll provide you with education, we'll provide you with tools to build, you know, make a garden or whatever it is that they thought that we should be doing. But when people criticize us, they should really look at the reasons why that exists. Why is it that we get subsidies for housing? Why is it that we don't pay income tax? You know, don't point the finger at us. Point the finger where it really belongs, and that's to your federal government, your fathers of confederation, and, and everybody else that cooked up this little deal to limit us. You know, I mean, this, I mean, the Indian Act exists not for our benefit, like they want you to believe. They exist. The Indian Act exists so that people can come in and steal our land. Brian Vanderbush wraps his last load of the day. He's happy to be back at work. It's been a rough winter in the bush. Logging's been shut down because of bad weather and mill closures. I got to be careful with this thing. I lost my two front teeth already once. for the Hoban Shield family mill in Kitwanga, 20 minutes down the road from the big Carnaby mill. Everybody in Kitwanga either works for the Hoban Shields or is related to them, or both. There's two landmarks in Kitwanga, Minas Diner and the Hoban Shield mill. The boss in the office is Bud Hoban Shield. I have never seen a computer in this office. Where are the computers in Kitwanga Lumber? You run everything out of your head, bud? No, we have, uh, we, we don't do that much business. It's not necessary. Lauren Hobenshield oversees the mill. All the Hobenshields were raised in the same cabin built about a mile away from where the mill is now. Their parents homesteaded the valley in 1928. After 60 years of logging, the Hoban Shields figure their family is about as native to this part of the country as you can get. But on this morning, one of the Hoban Shields logging operations is shut down. The Lesquique, or Eagle Clan, says that this land belongs to Chief Simadiks. They've blocked the road with their pickup. They've started a blockade. 
Art Loring once felled trees near here. Now he's telling loggers to go home. People around here used to call Art a bad act. He partied hard, and he rode in the rodeo. At 14, Art got his first job in the bush. Five years later, he was making big money as a faller. He told me about when he was falling trees along the Cranberry River, deep in the old growth forest. There was trails there that those grizzlies were using for thousands of years. And you could tell it by uh, eight inch uh, trails that these, and a grizzly steps in his tracks all the time. He doesn't have a solid beaten path, it's, it's steps. And these steps were roughly eight to nine inches deep. And I was following one, one area in the cranberry and I ran into that situation where grizzlies were coming in and you could see they were using it for years and years and years. And we were cutting all of the trail unit out right down to the riverfront. And so there, right away, we took away the, the road that the grizzly was using in order for him to come down into the river to feed. And that got to me and I had asked uh, the guy I was working for, to move that boundary back off of the grizzly bear trail, which meant moving away from the, the creek or, or the Cranberry River back away maybe two, three hundred yards off of the, the riverfront, which would have left the, the, the grizzly bear trail intact then. But he wouldn't move it because of the value of the timber that lay in the repairing zone there. So he told me that I had to fall it, and I told him that I wasn't going to go in there and, and wipe that trail out. He said, well, if you don't, I'll get someone else. And I said, well, fine, get someone else. Art quit working for the logging companies. Now he's working with the chiefs of the Eagle Clan. The chiefs say they don't want to stop the logging. They just want to change how it's done. That's why they want to stop the clear cutting. That's why the Eagles have set up a blockade. We ask that all of our chiefs be protected in the decision that they have made. Pray also that the village in Kibengar is not harmed by the thing that we are about to do now. The Hoban Shields have clear cut this area except for a fringe of trees. Now the Eagles want to work with them to develop a new way of logging. And in the meantime, the Eagles are demanding $75 for every load of logs felled on this land. Are you willing to compromise on this a little and, and give them some of what they want, if not all? Well, I don't think that should be coming out of our pocket to, to give it to them. It should be, we're paying high enough royalties and thumpage the way it is, so uh, I think somebody else should be handing out to them, not us. And who's that somebody else? The Ministry of Forests. That's what came to mind. That's what the not Trucker Brian Vanderbush can't get to work. Just here to check as he was walking the road. You guys want to check your mail to get groceries. Road walking down there. You guys think. I'm not talking about that. I walk to work out of here. I'm losing money. I'm starving. Oh, Art, come on, eh? That's all right. Get for tea, no? Get for that, eh? Eh? Come check your mail, you might not be able to get the post office, eh? Or get groceries. Good. I don't worry about it either. Just come get check your mail. See what happens. It's 
funny, you know, he, I saw three years ago that son of a bitch was a faller. And he felled trees just the same way they're being felled today on hillsides and that. And, and then he does a 180 and he's, he's right for saving the forest and saving his land. That's just being a hypocrite, I think. What the hell is he doing out there years ago? He made a good living cutting logs down, but things he don't want to do anymore, he figures, I guess he figures everybody else shouldn't do it, eh? But uh, that's what he used to do. So I, I think he's just a male, he's just a pig. You know, just, just thinking for himself and his Indian buddies. That's all they want is their own money, their own land. So I've been off since almost three months now. I haven't received the pogey check, and all my savings are gone. They tell you to go back to work, and you go for a week. Next week, there's a roadblock. That's because our government, I figure, ain't doing their job, so they're taking it out on us, which I don't think is fair. I'm pretty sure if you'd ask anybody in this town about roadblocks, you come up with some pretty disgusting sayings for them, because uh, a lot of people have lost their shirts. Well, just lost a lot of money, eh? You figure it costs lots of money to run a rig like this. Insurance, I'm just a driver. I'm just happy about that. But if you're an owner-operator, you're losing a lot of pennies. Like, they're there blocking our roads for us to work. Why not block the roads for them so they can't pick up their welfare checks or their unemployment checks and stop them from getting groceries in town here. They can buy them down the village and stuff like that, eh? Because they're all up here buying. Hell, same guys that are at the roadblock go to Hoban Shields Mill and ask for a job, for Christ's sakes, eh? Pretty gutsy, I figure, <laughs> after cutting somebody's throat. You know, there's no reason for all this. You ought to talk to a lot of those natives down there. They don't want nothing to do with it. You know, they're basically Indian, but they're basically like a white Indian, eh? But then all it takes is two or three, four of them to stew the pot, I guess. You know, that's all it takes. And the rest do follow. You know, they're not the only people in the world. Canada isn't just Indian and white. There's Chinamen, Pakis, Portuguese, everything for breeds in Canada. It's a mixed race. So I don't think they have, should have the right to say it's their land and everything belongs to them. Don't belong to anybody. <laughs> really no. Mina's Diner is the best place and the only place to eat in Kitwanga. I set up my video camera and order a special. There's a truckle special with bacon, ham, and sausages with toast or hash browns. And the loggers is with bacon, ham, sausages, and eggs with pancakes. And the aggressive is the big omelet. And then you get the aggressive tracker, the aggressive logger. <laughs> you gotta look down the road 50 years and say, okay, we plant it now, 50 years from now, somebody else can log it and they're gonna have good logging, they're gonna be able to make something. Or, I mean, nobody makes anything out of that old growth shit, anyhow. I mean, you do it because it has to be done, but nobody makes anything out of it. You have to have the other to go with it. And, uh, and until they shoot some of them goddamn environmentalists and get them out of the way <laughs> so the person can do something, I mean, Christ, this country well, the thing is, they don't like Chicken burgers, one with onion rings. Okay. A clubhouse, a double cheeseburger. Get it? My daughter. Back in the 50s, uh, if they could have settled then, it would have been easy. The natives would have been easily satisfied. And But now, <laughs> we've educated them to the point where now they realize that, hey, we just keep hanging on here. We're going to get a lot more than we even bargained for. We're better than they ever had before. Because when they lived off the land here, they didn't have a good, they were all starving, basically. Now they got everything they want and more. They got TVs, they got paved roads, they got hydro, they got, you know, I, I mean, they got it better than we have, really. Lauren Hobenshield is headed for the band office on the nearby Gitwanga Reserve. He's armed with a court injunction demanding the Eagles remove the blockade. You can serve it if I was up there, yeah. 
I can't throw it with here. Yeah, well, they told me to give it to you, so. If I was up there, yeah. No. That's the way I know it works. Are you really? Well, no, I'm that's right. true. Right. Uh, that's the way I know it works. Well, you refuse to take the. Uh, because I don't need to take it. Okay, well, I've done my work, so I go. Okay. <laughs> Look <laughs> at this beautiful scenery, eh? This is a nice, beautiful day, isn't it? Behind the blockade, the Eagles head back to the Hoban Shields closed down logging site to get logs to build their roadblock. We're going to go down and get some, uh, some more of our wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our wood. <laughs> Totally prove otherwise. I'm at the stage now. I have to go to stage three, plan plan B. Stage three, plan B. Yeah. What's stage three, plan B? <laughs> Don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's getting like they're looking down on us. I feel personal. Does that mean that they want all of us to just leave? Where are we supposed to go? What, do you, what are you saying when you say we want our line back? Define that. Define it. We can't go back in history. Oh. We can't. We can't all just sort of move out and. And, and go where? somewhere else. If you listen to them, the whole the whole country was theirs. You know, I think it's right. We did. We just came in and we, we just took over. I think that's absolutely right. But I don't know what can we do about it. We can't take us all out and ship us out to China or something. I mean, what are we to do? <laughs> Are you going to work somewhere else or are you off work today? No, or I'm what? off. I've been off for, I've lost, this is my seventh day already I've been off. So it's getting, getting pretty serious. Yeah. It's almost, well, it's half a month's pay almost. So. Are you going to go talk to these guys? No. There's no point in it. They don't know what they're doing here anyway. Every time you talk to them, they, you know, they don't know what they're here for. They want to stir trouble, that's all. They want media attention. Just to get the government to move, that's all they're after. I'm getting awful tired of it anyway. And that's the trouble, everybody's getting tired of it, and that's going to cause trouble, maybe that's what they want. You know, but one of these days, there's going to be a few of us come up here, and we're just going to move it or something, and then there's going to be trouble. I've, I've got friends there I've known for 25 years, and they're good, and, you know, natives, good people. Nothing wrong with them, and they're just, well, in fact, I respect a lot of them better than I do a lot of the white men because of their cultural, uh, the way they were raised, their friendship to them is, is really important. You know, they, they treat you right, and I, it's, a, it's a known fact. If you get broke down along the road around here, 
uh, 30 cars that go by you, and 10 cars will stop, and just about nine out of those 10 will be natives. They'll stop to help you. And it's been like that. It's been like that for years. Now it's getting to the point where, yeah, you don't, <laughs> people don't want to stop to help them, and they don't want to stop to help you anymore because they don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. Unless they, you know, unless it's somebody that you absolutely know. But not a stranger, they won't stop because, oh, it's just a dumb white man, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and the white man's the same way. Just dumb Indians stuck along the road. Well, let him sit there. Mm -hmm. Things like that. And it, 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 ah, it's, I don't know. Go away, man. Promise then is a threat. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Blockades are hard ways to deal with land. It hurts all of the communities. <clears throat> It don't just hurt the native communities or the non-native communities, but everybody feels it, eh? And if we can't stop because of that hurt. We can't just say that the communities are hurting, let's quit fighting for our land. We can't, we've never been able to do that. And so the stronger people go ahead, they're the ones that'll keep on addressing it. And the ones that say they don't like blockades in their hearts, they were supporting us. On the 27th day of January and the 30th day of January, 1992... The courts have issued an enforcement order for the Eagles to take down the blockade. Lauren Hobenshield is left to stagger through the legalese of yet another court document. Counsel for the defendant may come be and hereby be enjoined from impeding, restricting, prohibiting, and otherwise distributing the use of the access by anyone to the Nash Y Road, Nash Y Road, by the court J. Jones District Register. Right now, we have an opportunity to, to work together. But if it's overlooked, then we have no choice but to con continue the fight we have. We're prepared to go to jail if that's what yeah. is needed. OK. OK. We should have got rid of them a long time ago. <laughs> we wouldn't have this trouble right now. <laughs> I wouldn't be here standing in front of a camera. I'd be working. <laughs> just like this mud on this truck, eh? A guy could uh, just hose it off like he could do to the Indians and not worry about it. Should be nice, eh? Gotta be going over that way. Oh, this way, boys. Wait, what? Oh, right there. You know the angle of the nail there? That's tradition. <laughs> God, I don't know. Is it? I don't think I want to go home. It's nicer than my house. <laughs> These yeah, I got recognition really. over here. <laughs> I'm a somebody now. Ask them questions about what are, what are you guys out here for, and they don't answer you. They, they just go, uh, I don't, and they don't see nothing. But that, well, I heard that half of them are up there for because they get paid to stand there. 
it builds a lot of tension between everybody in this community mostly and uh, like like Mike said there's a lot of people up there that don't really know what they're doing up there so uh, it makes a guy really frustrated it, we talked about it a few times during the week and we thought we'd just go up there and talk to him and basically ask him why they were up there and what their what their meaning was or their purpose I don't uh, I can't remember what time it was. It was pretty late at night. Uh, we jumped in a vehicle with these other people and we just went for a drive up there. Alcohol, obviously, because you know, they walked in here on the premises here with alcohol. So I had a pretty good idea what they were up to, but intentionally, I figured they just came to talk. Eh? But that wasn't the case when I seen all those guys coming out and throwing beer bottles and throwing those um, what do you call them? Cocktail, cocktail with with uh, gas in it. Eh? He kept kept intimidating us. And then that's when the rest of the crew, their crew, went along and made an attempt to burn the fort. It actually was very scary in a way, and yet we had to make sure we were safety as well. So we had a very busy, busy, busy night. You know, there was uh, the <laughs> slashing of the tires on the vehicle, which is a criminal offence, and whoever did that is going to be charged with the appropriate section under the criminal code. And uh, there was also other criminal acts in, in throwing the Molotov cocktails and, and uh, ramming the building, or ramming the, the stockade. And all that's been investigated at this particular moment. And uh, once those who have committed those offenses have been identified, then the appropriate charges will be laid at that time. No charges were laid. Why couldn't the, the ministries that are within our Art areas... Art comes down off the roadblock to interrupt a government forestry meeting. He's trying to force the government to pay attention to the blockade. Open Shields has to take a hard stand. We have to take a hard stand too. But what is happening right now with our communities is we've had uh, gas bombs thrown at us. We've had uh, tear gas bombs thrown at us. We know damn well guns are very close to coming out. But we as a clan can't turn around and run from this picture. Otherwise, we'll never get the chance to develop. And our kids will never get to be able to say that they're eagles, or that they're wolves, or that they're frogs. <laughs> There's uh, some cop cars coming. Eight bun wagons. And what we'd like to do now is uh, quickly erect these poles. We're going to put up the walls in the last geek. You're going to be on the inside. And those that would like to get arrested along with us, you're welcome. <laughs> those that don't want to be arrested <coughs> will be on the outside of the fort. <laughs> I think that it's up to the government, the forestry, to have that blockade removed. And it should be done right now. It shouldn't take a week to have a blockade removed. So, Bud Hovenshield, are there two laws in this valley? They think so. Well, they think there's one. They think it's the Gitsan law, and we think it's the Minister of Horror. So what the hell is going to happen? Well, that's a very good question. The valley waits for an answer. Fearing confrontation, the Forest Service calls the Hobenshields and the Eagles to a meeting. The Eagles are demanding the logging stop for a year. They want to work out a logging plan with the Hobenshields. But the Forest Service says no. Government policy can't and won't recognize any native land title. The Hobenshields 
are worried about setting an expensive precedent with the Eagles, but they also fear violence building in the community. This is Northern Gridlock. What do you think of today's arrangement? Oh, it uh, went very good. I'm very pleased with it. Uh, nice to see these guys tearing it down. The Hoban Shield brothers move first. They have to live in this valley, and they want to live here in peace. They said it was their territory, so we recognize that. We had a discussion there about uh, more input in our logging plan, and we agreed we wouldn't touch this timber. We're going to clean up what we got fell here, and we wouldn't touch the rest of it for one year. All that time, was it had been taken down, it kind of felt like there's a little park going to be missing for a while. And uh, knowing that we accomplished something from it, I was happy and sad at the same time. But most of the time, I felt free while I was in this fort. You guys have done something that no other people have been able to do, eh? and uh, we appreciate it. It's the end of winter. The eagles are dancing tonight celebrating control of 100 square kilometers of land. But a small victory in a valley in northern British Columbia goes unnoticed by a world market which keeps buying and selling and cutting. The Carnaby Mill, the economic miracle, is up for sale. There are rumors Westar Timber is bankrupt. A pulp and paper giant from Montreal is buying Carnaby, and with it, the license to cut thousands of square kilometers of forest, the same land the chiefs have been fighting for in the courts for the past eight years. The chiefs take the government to court to stop the sale, but the sale goes through to the chiefs the land has been sold out from under them again. September, Indian summer on the Gitwanga Reserve. When Westar shut down this old mill on the edge of the reserve two years ago, they said it was temporary. Now the new Montreal buyers say the shutdown is permanent. The new buyers have decided all the trees they cut will be processed at the big Carnaby mill, 25 kilometers away from here. Unemployment on the reserve is now dangerously close to 100%. The Gixon are running out of options. September 17, I get a phone call from Art Loring. Once again, he says, the Gixon have been left out of decisions directly affecting their lives. He says it's time to make the government listen. No trains are to come through the Gittengoff Reserve effect at uh, 12 midnight tonight. The barricades are going to be erected, so you won't be able to go through. The blockades are up again, but this time they're not against local loggers. They're against the government and big business. The Gixon stopped the Canadian National Railroad. We've got a, a running dispute with CN. That's been going on since 1910. And we've had an uh, ongoing dispute with the province, and that's been going on since 1871. And we've been having an ongoing dispute with Canada, and that's been going on before Confederation.
The railway runs right through the Gitwangah Reserve. Trains haul lumber, grain, and coal for export. To blockade the tracks is to blockade the economy of northern British Columbia. The Giksan are forcing the government to listen. And you can't continue to treat us this way. Don Ryan has got as far as the Deputy Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. And we have to go to, to this measure by doing the blockade on the CN to put the squeeze on. And we don't particularly enjoy doing that. But that seems to be the only thing that you people listen to and react to. Crisis management, misgovernment. It doesn't make any sense for me to be kicked around from one table to the other. There's four tables that I have to deal with. I have to deal with the Minister of Forest People, I have to deal with your ministry, then I have to deal with Stephen Owen, then I have to deal with the people who are setting up the Treaty Commission. I want one table. All right, good luck. We'll hear from you. Right, bye. The first time I talked to him for a while. So at least you're, you're moving toward key, key people, right, that, that are now scrambling. So what he's saying is that he wants to um, put together a proposal and he wants uh, to send it up to us tomorrow morning. Before well, whatever, you know, they're, they're going to do all kinds of different things. That's why it's important for you to continue to keep the pressure on, right? And you can, you can take this situation and make it a little ugly, right? You can take it to where it's ugly, and then it puts more pressure on these bastards, right? And then you can pull back again, and you can do it again, right? Arthur Loring. Arthur Matthews, Jr., Graham Morgan, Guy Morgan, Sr., Darlene 2 p.m. the next day, the railroad serves a court injunction ordering the Gixan off the tracks. Trespassing on the plaintiff's railway right away between miles 71. The chiefs refuse. Now the Gixan are defying the train, the government, and the courts. Creating a nuisance adjacent to or in the vicinity of the railway. And what we're saying to the CN people is that we're putting a squeeze on them and the feds will have to do something. And the feds will try to come down heavy on us, but we'll retaliate. All right? So you can tell them this. The tracks are going to be lifted. The tracks are going to be lifted. All roads leading onto the reserve are closed. The native village of Getwanga waits for the government to make its next move. Think about the, what the implications would be, the food and the supporters, <clears throat> the security for tonight. Do you want to take that? That comes down to that. And it really depends on which direction that they send the train in from. You remember the last time we planned that the logs have to be in between the tracks, mm -hmm. right? Not across, but in, in the tracks, right? And so what I, what I said to the province tonight was that, that we've lifted the tracks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you don't want them getting to there right away. The railway system is plugged up with traffic. Uh, they can't move anywhere. PRG is out of grain. We've got vessels in the port commitments to foreign countries to deliver that grain uh, that we could stand to lose at this point in time. Uh, we're a hostage. Well, apparently, from what I understand, there's something like 30 to 40 trains backed up. And they're scared. I mean, when they served the injunction at 12.30, they could have come in right after that. Look, it's almost 12 hours now, and they're not here. They're scared. And the RCMP are scared. They're more scared than us. So that's what people have to put in their minds, that these people are scared of us. And we shouldn't back down, because we're going to win. CBC Radio News, British Columbia. Good morning. CBC News, Vancouver. A native blockade in northwestern BC will be removed this morning. The RCMP plan to move in and start arresting protesters. Lock this right off. If they try to come through here, hit them with the hose. 
and, and don't uh, back off, just get them with the hose. If uh, it looks like they're going around, then a group should take off down and, and have that truck running too down there. If you want to um, arrest the people that we have out there, you walk on your guys' so-called right-of-way and nowhere else. In the Supreme Court of British Columbia, Canadian National Railway and the plaintiff, Larry Earl Moore, chief of the Gitwan Gak Indian Band, and on behalf of himself <laughs> and all other members of the Gitwan Gak Indian uh, Band. Okay. I find Sam, myself George in the middle of a scene inherited from our uneasy past. White people confronting native people. And between us, a piece of paper. A written law with its one-sided history of who controls the land. John Doe and Jane Doe defendant. I think it's important uh, if you focus your attention to that pole there. Those poles tell us we're right. We own this land, not the court, not the province, nor the federal government. That's why we do this, because we have a right here. And your courts come in to take us away because you feel you have a right. We don't agree because we've lived here far longer than you guys have. I hope you guys understand that. I understand your frustration. I would ask that you now leave the railway right of way, please. Those of you that do uh, not want, wish to be subject to the uh, the injunction order and the arrest. Just the two gentlemen, Art, uh, you're, or are you accompanying them? Uh, just three of us. Three of you? And we're being accompanied by some people. Now, we're still in front of you. can buy some of How many generations? People are estimated to have lived here in Kibungar 30,000 years. Uh, through the, the ice ages. When the ice uh, resided, they come back in. When it built up, they're up in the mountaintops. How far, uh, how far back can you trace your heritage? Uh, well, my, my name is 20,000 years old. Uh, my wife's name is 12,000 years old. And you're with, uh, you're with the, Eagle, the Eagle Clan here? I'm uh, one of the sub-chiefs of the Eagle Clan. Where we're going through here now, some of the oldest of our graveyards are here. Those were all of the little houses that used to sit here. <clears throat> it's not going to happen overnight, but I hope it's heading in the right direction. I hope so. After 15 months, I'm heading back to the city. I carry South stories about a mountain with two names and a new understanding of how two histories, one so new, the other so old, can walk side by side down a narrow strip of northern track. 